Okay, so I think it's recording now if everything works properly. So you should be able to watch this recording this afternoon once I get this uploaded. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a different session today uh, because normally this would be a lab day, but because I want to use some of the things um, that I came up with for today, I want to use them tomorrow since I didn't get to teach some of my classes. Um, we're going to go over some, yeah, we're going to kind of do like our review day today and then our lab day tomorrow. And that way um, it can be a little bit more interactive tomorrow, but today's just going to be some more review, if that makes sense. So here we go. Uh, the quiz is due today. So you, I will give you some time at the end of class to work on that uh, because it is due today. Um, le and let me just make a mention about this. Um, for our grade book right now, it's not set up the way that it needs to be to get grades into Infinite Campus. So your lab safety discussion and your history of forensics discussion have not been graded for the most part. Um, I put in some grades for the lab safety, dis safety discussion, and then I realized that they're not actually like going anywhere useful. So for right now, um, about half of those are left ungraded, um, but I don't want you to not do these assignments because you will get behind if you miss these due dates consistently. Um, so I don't want you to like, You've got the lab safety discussion, you've got the history of forensics discussion, and you've got your history of forensics quiz that was due today. Um, and if you keep letting those pile up, then it's gonna really, um, I don't know, be cumbersome when you finally get those all done. So please make sure that you're staying on top of that, um, even though you're not seeing grades coming through, because I promise I will get them graded. I just need to know how to set up my grade book. So it's kind of important. Um, okay. So uh, here's our standards for forensic science. Um, and again, we're just in our introduction stage here. We're just getting started. So everything that we're talking about, we're not really going into specifics other than history just yet. Uh, so just hang tight, okay? And we'll cover these standards as we go. All right, so let's talk about some history of forensics that we have not talked about yet. Um, because I think that some of this is important and it wasn't lined up just like this in Canvas, but I do feel like I'd like to give you a more proper timeline for forensics. So way back in the day, let's start all the way back at 250 BC. We had this Greek philosopher, philosopher named Archimedes, and he was a scientist and a mathematician, and he's considered maybe like the first forensic scientist ever, okay? And there's this uh, little study that he did kind of forensically using a process where he was trying to determine something about a crown and gold and their weight, okay? So what I want you to do is basically Google it, okay? Uh, I want you to look up this story about Archimedes and I'm gonna copy this to the whiteboard. You don't have to Google it. You can use whatever research database you would like. Um, I'm gonna unlock the whiteboard and maximize this. And then I would like for you to take some time now and research Ar Archimedes and tell me what he did with his gold test. Give me some little facts and tidbits about that. And I'm gonna give us a little timer here for, let's give it uh, seven minutes just to be random. And then I want to see some good posts on the board about what Archimedes did. Okay, so ready, go. I'm gonna pause our recording here. Okay, so in our time that we were researching, uh, we also found out that, um, that uh, this Archimedes was the same one that discovered pi. So interesting, really crucial to a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> wow, that's crazy, RT. Okay, so um, Mary says that the gold crown displaced, let me see if I can use my pointer, displaced more water, so he believed it to have more metals in it, okay? Um, and then Camille said he came to the conclusion that the crown was not gold and that the goldsmith had mixed some silver into the gold, okay? So I don't know who posted these other two, but somebody said because the crown had displaced more water than the pure gold piece, 
He concluded that the gold in the crown had some other metals mixed in. He worked out a plan to find out the purity of the gold in the crown and took two bowls and filled them with water to the brim. He then uh, placed each bowl separately in the middle of two other larger ve vessels. So basically what he did was he wanted to see was this crown made of pure gold, right? And uh, what he did in the process was he um, took two um, bowls or jars of water, whatever you want to call it from back then, and uh, found out that this and this weigh the same weight. But when you put them in water, they displaced different amounts of water. So he concluded that the gold crown could not have been pure gold because it did not uh, displace the same amount of water as um, gold did. So it was not the same density, in other words. Uh, so that was kind of like, yeah, I mean, he's a super smart guy, right? He came up with his own forensic investigation method in order to um, figure out if the gold was um, pure or not. Density is like um, the weight per volume. Is that right? I don't know. We're not. Let, don't let me tell you the wrong thing. Density. Because now I'm doubting myself now that you asked me. Yeah, mass per volume. Okay. So um, in other words, you know, I <laughs> know. No, it's fine. It's also a scientific concept. I was just doubting myself because I wasn't prepared to explain density right now. Um, but yeah, it's the mass per volume. So if the gold had had the same density as the crown, it would have displaced the same amount of water, if that makes sense. Okay. Good job. Thank you guys so much for participating in that. That was awesome. All right. So moving on. Uh, the Chinese we talked about have been doing medical examinations at least 900 years before this guy, Bartolomeo de Verignana, maybe? Uh, and he performed the first autopsies in the West in 1302. So the Chinese were kind of way ahead of their time when it came to autopsies and medical examinations. Um, we're going to talk about, I know, I'm not, I guess that's an Italian name I would, I would venture to guess, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so talking about the ancient Chinese, this guy called Song Chi. I think that's a really cool name, Song Chi. He wrote the first book of forensic medicine in 1248. So a long, long time ago. And look at him. He looks so serious about it. He's like, look at me. I'm Song Chi. I'm a forensic investigator. And he wrote this book called Si Yuan Lu, maybe? See, look at me. I can speak Chinese. And uh, it translates to the washing away of wrongs. And it's talking about specific pr procedures for coroners, uh, who are the people legally sanctioned to inquire about a death. Um, and of course, we know that coroners weren't the same back then as they are now. Uh, a lot more coroners these days are required to actually have medical experience. During the Enlightenment, we moved on to advances in chemistry, biology, human anatomy, physical science. I mean, that's why it's called the Enlightenment, because they're really just making these advancements in all these scientific fields. Um, and then this guy, Andreas Vesalius, I'm really working on my phonics skills today, published uh, on the structure of human anatomy in 1543, and it was a detailed account of human anatomy uh, that was available for the first time, okay? I'm not gonna ask you all of these names. The guided notes in, the, um, in Canvas are gonna tell you the ones that I'm looking for, but I just want you to know who these people are because they were important for the development of forensics. Then we have Sir Thomas Brown, and in 1658, he published the treatise Hydriotaphia, uh, in which he described remains found in burial urns. Yeah, Thomas Brown, that one was the easy one, right? And he included the description of something called adipocere, which is really fun. It's a soapy, waxy product of fat decomposition in dead bodies. Don't you love that, adipocere? Soapy, waxy product of fat decomposition. Woohoo! Okay, so Sir Thomas Brown is the one that uh, gave us that description of adipocere. Sounds real gross. Which, by the way, speaking of soapy, waxy fat, um, 
you know, that's what most fat used to be, I mean, that's what you, most soap used to be made of anyways, was pig fat or hog fat, lard. That's what they used to use for most soaps. So this is urns. The R and the N just ran together with this font type. <laughs> Good question, Hannah. Yeah, it's burial urns. Like, you know what they put um, cremated remains in? You know what I'm talking about? Yep, urns. U R N S. Okay, see, these are urns right here. Urns. All right, some other milestones in enlightenment. <laughs> it's just the R and the N ran together, people. It's just the font. I'm sorry for my font selection. Okay. Uh, in 1609, Francois de Mel published the first book on question document examination, and that deals with documents in crime investigations, and his works started the idea of handwriting analysis to exposed forgeries. So, um, <laughs> so uh, Francois de Mel started looking at forgeries. Okay, welcome back, RT. And then in 1784, John Toms of Lancashire, England, John Toms also being an easier name, was convicted of murdering Edward Coleshaw with a pistol. And they looked at Coleshaw's wound and found that a piece of newspaper had been used as wadding for the pistol's musket, um, where the musket ball was found. And the newspaper piece, they took it out and they matched it exactly to a torn newspaper found in Tom's pocket. So they dug that piece of newspaper out, they unwrapped it, and they took the newspaper from Tom's pocket and matched it, and that's how um, they convicted him. And that would be called individual evidence, by the way, uh, because uh, you can't just match that to anybody, right? It's specific to that individual. The odds that somebody would accidentally tear the same page of the same newspaper in the same exact way and wad it up and stick it in a musket at a crime seat that you happen to be at are like a gazillion to one, right? So it's an individual piece of evidence, um, given that it would be extremely, extremely, extremely rare for that to accidentally happen. Caleb, you know, I don't know if that's ever happened in the history of ever. So that would be a unique case for sure. Okay, another super important name in forensics, this guy, Juan Vucidic, and we're going to talk about him later when we talk about fingerprints, okay? Uh, remember we talked about Galton being the father of fingerprinting? And in 1892, Juan Vucidic used Galton's system of fingerprint analysis to successfully identify a, a, mother her, a mother who murdered her two sons, which is really sad to think about. But he was able to convict her using her fingerprints, and that was the first case where we did this. I know, how horrible is that, Caleb? Evil in the world. Wow, you guys are getting so existentialist today on me. I don't know what's happening here. <clears throat> All right, are we totally lost so far? No, he did not come up with the Galton system. Galton did. Francis Galton did. Uh, he was the father of fingerprinting, but Juan Vucidic was the first one to use it to convict a murderer. Uh, do you guys want to take some time to look up that story? Because you absolutely can. Let's do it. I'll give you five minutes to uh, look up the story and share with me what you find out about this Juan Vucidic case. You can't on your own. Why not? You can do it. Why would you want to sweep the floors before your mom comes home today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Oh, but you can tell your parents that I told you to go look up Juan Vucidic in the murder. It's, it's all for learning, right? Yep, I said it. I told you to. You got a recording of it, so 
I'm going to pause our recording, by the way, while we're doing this. So, okay. okay, so somebody told us um, he was a police official and he devised the first workable system of fingerprint identification, pioneered the first use of fingerprint evidence in a murder investigation. Okay, he demonstrated the utility of the fingerprint evidence in 1892, which resulted in the identification and conviction of a suspect for first degree murder. All right, good. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, I mean, there's not a whole lot of, <laughs> go for it, RT, I won't judge you. Um, the, uh, okay, the case that he used though, while, while you're doing that, while you're being silly, <laughs> nice. Uh, is the Rojas case. That's the name of the mother. And um, I, I honestly don't know like very specific details about uh, why she did it or anything like that. But I do know that the fingerprint that was used to convict her was because she left a bloody fingerprint behind. Um, obviously, she touched something during the crime uh, that had blood on it. And then um, she... Uh, she accidentally touched something else, which left behind a um, a fingerprint. Now, does anybody remember from our videos yesterday what that kind of blood spatter, quote unquote, is called? The blood spatter where you touch blood and then you touch something else? Not cast, okay. Uh, transfer, yeah, not, not yesterday, Tuesday, sorry. It's transfer blood spatter. So if you touch something and you touch something else, that is called transfer, even if it's like a shoe print or something like that. So it was a transfer bloody fingerprint that got her convicted. So if you ever find out why Miss Rojas killed her sons, then you just let me know. But I, I do not have that um, information for you. Transfer, Caleb, is when you touch something and touch something else. So think of blood as almost like an ink. Okay, if you touch something that's bloody and then you touch a surface that's clean, like a wall or a railing or something like that, it's like you've used your ink, that's the blood, to make a print on something else. Yeah, they didn't know, they didn't do their homework in forensic science, that's right. I really hope I'm not just training you guys to be like better murderers in the future. I really don't think so, right? With great power comes great responsibility. Uh, it's transfer, not transference. Yep, transfer blood spatter. She wanted to better her chances of marrying her boyfriend. Okay, that was known to dislike children. Interesting, Randy. I did not know that. That does not seem like a good reason to murder your kids. I mean, not that there is one ever but that's pretty shallow right it's pretty bad <laughs> that's pretty horrible yeah right we're like not marry the guy hello priorities okay so the birth of uh modern forensics uh Modern forensics is associated with the advances in science that we've made over the years. Uh, so many of the things that we've studied are not new, but the techniques advanced. Just like we were talking about a second ago, Hannah, let me make sure, I, yeah, I resumed our recording. Um, what we were talking about, Juan Vucetich, he didn't invent fingerprinting, but he advanced the science because he used techniques in order to convict that person of a crime. Um, same thing for fingerprinting in general to nowadays. Uh, we didn't invent fingerprinting, but now we have a computerized system to help us categorize and um, compare fingerprints. Which, does anybody remember the name of that database? Just getting ahead of ourselves here. Anybody want to take a guess? It's not CODIS. It is... <laughs> Not tacos. No. Okay, it's AFIS. A-F-I-S. You don't have to know that yet. Just curious to see if anybody picked that up the other day. Yep, AFIS. Okay, 
Uh, fingerprints were used way back in the day as signatures we talked about, and Francis Galton published that book that offered proof that fingerprints were unique to the individual. So this right here is why he is considered the father of fingerprinting. Uh, and does this remind you guys, anybody else, of that, um, if you've been to the Haunted Mansion in Disney World, he looks like one of the characters from the Haunted Mansion in, the Disney, in Disney World, in my opinion. Anybody? Is it just me? I think he does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's kind of creepy looking. Well, you got to go, Hannah. You got to go to the Honda Mansion. All right. Another important advancement in our forensic science that we've talked about is the comparison microscope. And it allows us to look at two different images, magnified images, and compare them to each other. And this is especially important when it comes to ballistics. So you can see these two images are from different microscopes, but they compile them into uh, images that are side by side so that we can um, really look and see if they're similar to each other. Um, so the comparison microscope revolutionized ballistics and tool mark analysis for the same reason. You can put two things up next to each other and look at them really closely and in great detail right next to each other. So they're a standard tool that we use for uh, forensics today. And that's a picture of a comparison microscope right there. Okay, low cards exchange principle we've talked about a couple of times already, says that whenever two objects come in contact with each other, each object leaves a trace on the other as material is transferred between them. So every contact leads leaves a trace, and this is a hallmark of forensic science and criminalistics. If we weren't sure of this, then it would be very difficult to ever gather ev evidence, okay? And it's super, no, not hallmark movies, okay, like a standard principle. Um, no, there's not an EOC for this class. It's just a final. So um, if this were not true, then uh, there would be not so many, um, pieces of evidence left behind when a crime is committed, but as we know, it is incredibly Im improbable, I won't say impossible, that you could completely eliminate any sign that you'd been somewhere, okay? Uh, my students last year tried to go through, well, what if you shaved your head and you wore a hazmat suit and you wore gloves and, um, you know, you made sure that you clean the crime scene afterwards and all this kind of thing. Well, all those things would be forensic countermeasures. They would help you to reduce the chance that you would still leave behind evidence. But chances are you're not going to get out of there completely without leaving any sort of evidence, okay? It's going to be really difficult. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the one, the podcast that I was just telling you about, the one um, that's called Up and Vanished, uh, is about a modern day crime um, in Georgia, actually. And uh, the problem with that crime is that it went unsolved for such a long time because there was a lack of evidence. The criminal obviously wore gloves, the crime scene didn't look very disturbed. Um, so they did a pretty good job at not leaving behind a lot of evidence. But um, they stayed on it long enough that they actually made a conviction. So I have not watched Scandal. So I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. So here's a video to kind of summarize what we talked about today. So if you'll just take a minute and watch this uh, video, I think it's a good little um, conglomeration of all the different people that we talked about today.
Kay, did you find anything particularly interesting about that video? Just curious. I I was really, um, I mean, not from that video be, because I knew this before, but just reminded of something that was interesting to me. <laughs> Sir Alec. Was anybody else surprised by the date for DNA fingerprinting? Yeah, mm -hmm. father of toxicology, that's right. Yeah, 1984 was when Jeffries came up with that DNA fingerprinting. And so that's pretty, pretty recent, right? I mean, recent, I guess I could say recent, it's over 30 years ago, right? But still, um, considering that a lot of these forensic um, methods have been around for longer. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's only been around for like, what, what would that be now, 35 years? So um, that video, I'm gonna post this whole uh, PowerPoint and this recording to uh, Canvas later today. So that might be a good studying tool if you wanna watch that video again, okay? All right, uh, let's not do this today. We're gonna do that tomorrow. It's gonna be fun, so you wanna be here, okay? But uh, I think I wanna save it. <laughs> for tomorrow because that will be a good little interactive activity. All right, so uh, let's take some time to do some work. I'm gonna pause our recording here uh, after I explain to you. Uh, so far, these things should be done. Your pretest, your getting started quiz, your forensics disclaimer quiz, and your lab safety discussion. If you don't have those done, or if you need some help finding one of those assignments, such as the pretest, let me know and I will help you, okay? Um, and then you should be working on your history of forensics discussion because that's due tomorrow and your history of forensics quiz because that's due today. But before you take your quiz, make sure that you study using those guided notes and your PowerPoints that I posted to um, Canvas. Okay. So let me pause. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about um, these assignments or did you have any difficulty locating any of them? Um, I answered Caleb's question. I um, updated one of the wordings to the questions on the quiz number eight, because I felt that was probably a better way to word that. Um, but does anybody have any questions or can you give me like a green check, thumbs up, smiley face, turtle, to let me know that you're doing all right? Using your feedback tools, let me know that you know what you're supposed to be working on, you found everything, don't have any questions, you're good to go. Two of you. <laughs> Everybody else okay? Speak now, Fred, hold, your, hold your peace. Actually, just kidding, if you have questions later, you can email me. <laughs> That's okay, Caleb, you're gonna have a second attempt. So if you don't do well the first time, study more for the second time. It won't give you the right answer, but you can go and study what you think you didn't do so well on and go back and take it again. <laughs> no, it will not show you what, well, I think it will show you the ones that you missed, possibly, but it definitely will not show you the right answer. So you have to go study. I know it's a hard thing. A hard thing but you got to do it <laughs> okay actually that's all I have for us today so um, if you have any questions you can ask me um, tomorrow we're gonna be looking over some more of this history stuff but I also have an interactive activity for us to do to review and um, some more review stuff that we'll be working on and so I will see you guys tomorrow bye <laughs>